Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, now, since we're starting to use machine learning in many of our products, and uh, many in our professional services as well, to provide machine learning to do some of the functions that uh, we was we're consuming humans' time, uh, and we think that. So let's put simply this way. So. Humans are very valuable, and they are very thoughtful, and they make mistakes sometimes, and they have very fine senses that can work within certain ranges. In other words, machines are way cheaper, uh, way faster than making decisions. They are, in many cases, much more reliable and dependable, and they can have sensory functions that are much more granular and work for in different ranges than humans. Do I agree? Okay. No? Partially. Partially. Yeah. No, no two things are the same in life, right? Every, everybody and every machine is unique. Is that okay? So, believe me, from experience, every time I develop or create a new model, it is different. Uh, sometimes because w when was the starting point of data it's working on and sometimes it's just because of the randomness uh, it did come to life with but it's my job then if I have a new trainee or a new something working for me that I provide the quality learning experience for that trainee it's machine learning, right? So how can I guarantee that the quality of learning would produce the behavioral expectations of my system? So do you think what, what factors would, would matter in here? Number of things. So we have to go through some data analysis and quality because the frequency of data, volume of data, the quality of data, the relevance of data, and the, uh, uh, the patterns of data being fed in would all factor in the behavior and the outcome of that model. So we're going to see what's going on here. I have already a model here. I have multiple, actually. Uh, but let's say, OK, so what, one of them I just started uh, an hour ago, the previous year. Uh, how about this? Let, let's stop it and start from scratch. So I'm going to delete my model. OK. So I have no model running. And then I'm going to start fresh. So as we know, with the machine learning model, when it's starting fresh, it's making sure that it's going to start. It's going to read data from database. That's the learning process. OK, keep going. OK, it's working. So in this system, the machine learning can be used in, in many different ways and, and can have different systems. But in, in our systems for anomaly detection, what we have is that we have data coming in from devices, sensors, can be cameras. In our case, we are interested in infrastructure, security, and performance kind of information. And being sent over a transport, in our case, can be telemetry. It can be other sources of uh, other methods of transporting the data. Goes to a receiver, something that would receive all this. Goes to a bus where this data can go, whether regionally or some other places. And then, in this case, because we are interested in teaching the model how things looked like in the past, like in this one, about is my traffic within the past 10 minutes or 20 minutes, as we are moving forward on this Tuesday afternoon, look right as a volume and rate and all the stuff, my business application traffic for all of my environment. 
or something is wrong or something is out or that basically the error is is high so we feed all this in that time series database where everything received is time stamped and when we retrieve the information we can say okay give me this information this number of data points for these measurements from these fields from these devices between this time and that time whether in a relative format or in a, a standard RFC format and uh, then we feed this into some machine learning model and first cycle is about to end so it's gonna annoy us a little bit until I move these windows it's gonna tell us what we learn or how things like now but don't have very high expectations for a newborn here or a new trainee okay so so I'm gonna keep jumping there's there's no s one sequence of, of talking about machine learning right but uh, here it's it's done with the uh, uh, first big cycle of learning that's why it took I don't know how many seconds on a very powerful Cisco US server so but uh, so supposedly on, on 18 di different unit directions, directions f paths for uh, business traffic here, the green is actually how the traffic looked like on each of these for the past 60 minutes. The blue is that models trying to predict how it's gonna look like based on between 2.05 p.m. to 3.05 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon. Okay, and we're gonna see that uh, it's uh, overestimating, underestimating. It's, but it's some extent. It's it's getting some feel for it, and actually, if you look, because it's the different scales, it's probably trying to favor the ones that would minimize its error because they have higher volume. First, if that makes sense, because my error is that everything here gets squared and contributes to the root mean square error, right? So all these deltas, here, 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 here. But it's, it's going to get better, OK? Another factor here also that uh, about the quality of, of the training experience is that I'm giving this data to the model in small batches. I'm not shooting tons of data at a new student and say, here it is. Actually, I'm doing, but I'm giving this to the student one book at a time. So I'm going through cycles. Are you okay with this? Good. Okay, the next one. Now, it's going to wait for a couple of minutes. In production, about five minutes. So new data has been collected and so on. We have moved in time by a certain point in time. And then it's going to go through another initial training first. The initial trainings also, we are starting with a higher learning rate. Okay, so higher learning rate for, uh, think of this as like if it's learning music or something. So the fluctuations can, can be a little bit high. And then we're gonna say, okay, now we did develop some kind of a feel for it. Now let's fine tune this. We're gonna decrease the learning rate in the next cycle and next cycle. And then in the production, we're gonna have a very small learning rate so it doesn't get skewed so much but by what has been happening for the last training periods. But, and there's other diagrams that we're gonna look at that indicate this learning process and the quality of it, how it's uh, developing. Okay. So the case here basically is that we have four uh, commercial stores that have certain business hours. Uh, one of them happens to be shifted in time, another time zone. So you're gonna see in the data a little bit of one hour shift for this, but they all have the main, the same business hours, but uh, they are not all doing as good as each other. And their business applications are in two data centers. So if you do the math here, you're gonna find, okay, here I'm starting to dig into the data, how the data looks like and where it's coming from and my format and also some of the factors that are gonna factor for me in the size and shape of that machine learning model. 
because I need to know what, how my inputs are going to look like, what kind of data, and how large it is. So if you look here, each of these stores has bidirectional communication with each of the data centers for business and security applications. And we have bidirectional communication between the data centers themselves for, uh, I don't know, replication, whatever is not my job. I'm just looking at the outcome of that. If you look at this, that means we have 18 unidirectional data paths, hence the 18 diagrams that you saw. Make sense? OK. And that's what I'm trying to predict. So I'm going to say my machine learning model predict for me, based on historical experience, how my traffic on these 18 directions, one by one, should have looked like within the last 60 minutes of this Tuesday afternoon. And uh, now I'm going to compare, have some logic that would compare with the actual and see how much of an error is there. And if the error is huge, then it's somebody's job to do something. So this is how it looks like. If I have, in this kind of machine learning, I'm taking something that can be done or normally or in the past would have been done by humans, people sitting there at the knock, three shifts, 24 by seven, looking at things like this, okay? Or to see them live, be like this. Here's I have the two data centers, here's the branches, and I have these the different traffic directions. Here's how it looks like on a weekday. Here's how it looks like on Saturday and Sunday. Here's during business hours, off hours. So some stuff doesn't change regardless if it's uh, open for business or not, or for trading. Some other stuff changes significantly based on what's happening with that store. And if that's a heavy trading day, if that's, uh, some stores are doing better than others. But uh, basically, if we just uh, click on any of these, we're gonna see, okay, the specific pattern for each of this. And if our operator would keep looking at this, and of course a trained operator, a learned operator, is gonna build some kind of previous knowledge and expectations now. Looking at this and looking at the last two hours or so, sorry, another learning cycle, it's going to see, okay, things look like this time of the day. Now, th this is in a different time zone in a different continent. So now they're starting to open for business, okay? The six-hour shift. So th th that's why they're just starting to wake up now. And, and that's okay, so I'm gonna mimic this. I'm gonna look, but now since I have a machine learning model that would work on the numbers, doesn't care about graphs and colors and whatever. So I'm gonna feed it this, the numbers directly. So the quantity and quality of data for teaching that student and the process of teaching. So here's what we found as a good process for teaching, which is nothing new. This is supervised machine learning here. But basically, create a model. I did delete the folder, remember? So if there was something that was stopped, I don't want that trained guy. But maybe you want to. So develop a model. That, that's newborn has no, has some logic, but it's random. All the weights and biases and, and factors are pretty much random. Feed it a library, but one batch at a time, OK? For each batch, come out here is going to give us some something, 18 by something, okay, numbers. We're going to compare it with the actual, because this is historical information, send it back a loss, we have a loss function to tell it, okay, where did it get it? Like, okay, initially it's not going to be that good. We do that thousands of times, thousands of times. And believe me, after a while, it's going to find a way to please the, the boss, right? Now, we're going to take it to a different set of data it hasn't seen before. So it's not cheating. It's not an open book. 
kind of a test. So another set of data that hasn't seen before. Now we're gonna see how it's gonna do on this data. That's the test. Give it a, a passing grade here if the root mean square error is within reasonable amount and if it passes the test I put it in production. Now I'm feeding it the historical information about all these previous Tuesday afternoons plus how trading earlier this day looked like because maybe today we have some storms, right? I have something different for today. And then it's telling me, giving me some kind of a prediction and I have the logic to compare the prediction with the actual. If I run this every 10 minutes, if something happens with the topology, somebody's trying to steal a database, uh, some traffic got rerouted through some other means, something went down, application didn't come up, uh, I don't know, uh, a store is on strike, something, believe me, anything and anything, or, or somebody's trying to simulate uh, tons of transactions that normally cannot take place in one store. So this is, this is where the data, okay, so data is basically, I'm going back, I'm saying, okay, predict this hour based on you, your knowledge of the area earlier. So predict the last 60 minutes based on your knowledge of the previous 60 minutes earlier on the same 60 minutes of the last week day or weekend day. So because they are different and on the same 60 minutes a week ago. So last Tuesday and two weeks ago. And maybe if you can have the luxury of feeding it, maybe a whole year is going to be also be more sensitive to even the Christmas shopping season, for instance, right? If you can feed it also weather information, it's going to start to find out how the weather impacts the trading, right? But for now, we are so happy with this, at least. It's all resources. But the initial training and every number of cycles working on this small training or actual training and prediction, because we're running this every 10 minutes, because we want to detect within 10 or 11 minutes max if something happens, a fault or a security breach or something. We don't want it to keep skewing towards that. So we force it to go back to the initial training, which is instead of working on 60 minute intervals, works on 24 minute 24 hour intervals okay huge amounts of data that's why the initial training took a little bit more time because the matrix going in or the array as we are going to see so this is that the, the training process so if you see these numbers scrolling and all these diagrams, of course, I mean, this, this is running in like a development or debugging mode. We are not replacing people with people looking at some other different diagram. But we can be running different models and see which one is better, some in production, some in development. So that's why you see the numbers scrolling, all this stuff. But basically, okay, so if I'm feeding uh, a 24 hour period, and uh, the day before, and a week before, and a week, two weeks prior, then that's four, uh, four inputs from four different periods of time, times 18 traffic directions that each of them has its own behavior. So four times 18, that becomes a data frame of 72. So my input layer to my model, machine learning model is 72. I have no choice in this case, unless if I decide to add maybe uh, another month or another week or something, and it's going to have to stay this way. And I know my output is 18. So my, my inputs are, input layer is 72, my output layer is 18. And since we have a, a data point from each of these every 30 seconds, we're using telemetry, so it's very lightweight on our devices, who cares? Uh, so times uh, two data points per, per minute, that would be 2,880 
data points. If we are taking a whole day's worth of this, 24 hours worth for each of these. If we are feeding in one hour, it becomes 120. So the inputs to the model are either for the large training 72 by 2880, or for the one hour predictions or training would be 72 by 120, the production mode, right? And we keep sending it back to training. That's why you see in the description that we're spitting out here when we're putting the data in a data frame. So hence the, the, the quality of education that we provide is that we make sure that we are feeding the right information. So here you're gonna see okay, a, a data frame of 72 columns each has a unique label, so things cannot get mixed up. And each of them in this case has 2,880 exact data points. They are all the same. And here we see, okay, what's the minimum, what's the maximum, all the stuff for debugging purposes. So how we process this data is that first we make sure that we are getting the right data by the query. And in order to that, do that, we want to make sure that our time shifts and, and time frames are accurate. And we have to compensate for any errors. So, for instance, if, if I'm querying the database for 60 minutes, because so, sometimes I'm querying the database for the last 60 minutes for all these readings. The last reading may, may have not registered yet. So actually, I'm cheating here. I'm going ba back for every reading in this world by one minute extra for two reasons. One is that if I'm missing the last one and I'm reading up to date to this point, I'm okay. The second reason is that because if I'm teaching somebody music or something, it doesn't make sense that I'm going to let them listen to different pieces of music at humongously different volumes. So in music, they use compressors, right? So here I do a couple of things. One is that I do baselining. So I'm not interested in the initial value, which can be 100 million, 500 million, blah, 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 whatever, or 10,000, right? So then I'm subtracting all the values for that column, subtracting the first point value from them, and then discarding it. OK? Then I have to play a game that what if a device didn't send me a value or did send me some bogus information for one of these so it doesn't conform to the float 64 or float 32 that my model is expecting? It's going to stop and give me NAN, not a number error. So what I do here is that I do some method like fill forward. So the previous reading from the same device, same direction, same whatever, just copy it forward, fill in that gap. It's just practical, right? But I don't want any, any errors. So making sure that our data is, is, uh, is conditioned properly. And also here, after we do all this baseline data frame, we are doing uh, a normalization. So the first run, we're picking one of the big values like the mean of the max of a 24 hour divided by 24, for instance, some value. And have asking our machine learning to add a normalization input layer that simply would divide everything going in by that fixed value. This would help the model converge faster. And instead of feeding it some numbers that some of them are in huge range, some of them are in very small range, it's going to take tons of time to converge. It's not designed for that logically. Or it may never converge within a time frame that's acceptable to us. And we're going to go through, OK, this model, OK, it seems like it's in the wrong path. After I've spent this much time, delete it, start again, and so on. So this lining, that's more for us, because I'm not interested in seeing graphs that start from 500 million, blah, blah, blah and compression to help the, the uh, this. So yeah, we take one of these numbers and just divide by it. Then we, we look at some of these numbers. OK, what's the minimum? What's the maximum? Every 
number of periods. So every 100 training cycles or something, we stop and graph it and we stop and say, or every 300 cycles or so. That's how we see these graphs. And also we spit out the, the minimum maximum here for each of this, for the actual, for uh, the labels and for the prediction. Just to make sure that things make sense. They are not like starting from high to low or a flat line with one value from beginning to end. And of course, I mean, nothing in this world would match the visualization. Plotting stuff is the best friend to us because minimum and maximum doesn't tell us much. So here's this stores and obviously some of them are in their early 20 minutes of business there. So how are we doing now? I think we're getting better. Here's the collective error rates. And you see in the beginning, I mean, this is log scale. So if I, if I don't make it log scale, it would have been like, I don't know, either. But you see here, it's going to get much better. And what actually we find out that the, the best indicator for us, very reliable indicator, is the normalized root mean square. Because we have seen that it's, it's normal because the changes in, uh, in the volume of trading and the normal changes between working hours and off hours to see this fluctuation here between the work day and the off hours. But if I normalize this by the volume of traffic or some number chosen from the normal, the volume of traffic, I'm gonna see something like this. That that normalized root mean square error in our case, and each case is different, will never exceed if things are changing within the normal limits will never exceed 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 something. I don't know why. Maybe a day that trading was not very good globally or maybe a day was trading was doing very well globally. I have no idea. But something happens and, and, and no joking here. No, no small effect. In, in a couple of ways. One is that if something happens and, and some of this, this actually, these two things happened not, by, not for testing. These, these things were, were actual. Uh, I may have the captures of them. So, Okay, I, I think I can tell you what was instant. Let me go back here. Here, okay. So, uh, suddenly at one point in time, there was some degradation in, partial degradation in the traffic in one of, from one of the stores, in, in both directions, actually, because of a problem, something stopped. So some traffic was passing through, some other traffic wasn't. And when that happened, that the RMC here, first is that you're gonna find that the RMC between prediction and between actual normalized, they're gonna start to split because now they are different. The second is that, so you're gonna start to see a gap. It can be a humongous gap, it can be a small gap. Now, uh, so this did shoot up to about 400 and something. Actually, to resolve the situation quickly, they did reset things. Reset or reload. And actually that reset or reload because actually reinitialized something. So actually the reset or reload did shoot this up to even a humongous, much bigger value. It was like a 1400 or 1500. Now for any of these events, it's not gonna have only an, uh, just a, a, a transient kind of effect, but actually, so here, here is, th this is a happy situation, but you start to see something like this. 
a very, very happy normalized RMC. Now they are splitting here. And it's not just impacting here, but because this data is impacting your predictions and learning for the next weekday or, or, or weekend day, and same next week, and, and, and also, also some part of the 24 hour training periods. So you're gonna live with that effect for a while, unless if you develop some mechanism to say, this is a permanent, acceptable, this is a new norm, or ignore this in your training, okay? Because it might be like a bad thing or it might be like you're adding one more application or one more trading or something or running a promotion or something like that. That might be, might be permanent, that it's gonna become part of the new norm, but uh, in about two weeks later, based on this. So after two weeks, it, it's gonna expect that, okay, now this is the, the new pattern. So uh, I think what we highlight here is that what factors in the quality of education is the process, the relevance of the data, the quantity, the quality of the data as well, and the data engineering that we do to make sure that things are relevant and consistently going in at the right time, and also the graphing to, to as a quality control mechanism for us. Any question? Any interest? You're gonna do it? Okay, the links to this and other use cases are, uh, also uh, for machine learning that maybe have nothing in common with each other. They're all different for different purposes. Uh, and actually for this, there's a, we have two versions on GitHub. One is a demo version that has data packaged from uh, December 24th to uh, January 16th. And as soon as you start, it's gonna shift its query in time back to January 9th. So you have about a week to run it in demo mode and you can play and adjust with many things. Uh, and we have another production mode that's already listening, or when it starts, it's gonna be listening on fresh uh, telemetry data coming in. And then you can make changes and, and look at your production data, but you're gonna need to have at least uh, 14, 15, 16, 17 days kind of worth, worth of data in order to start to train on uh, uh, historical. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of Cisco Live. Thank you.